in the music now. We can fight back, or we can lay down, or beat back the bank attack and stay proud. They got bailed out, we getting thrown out. Some living underwater in their own house. Mortgage, they hear the word foreclosure. They get scared and think it's all over. But now nah, the fight just begun. It ain't gonna be easy, but it must be won. Cause Bank of America's bad for America. Congress held hostage, they kidnapped the treasurer. What? This ain't the dream in the land of America. But we can change that if we stand up together. Yeah. The man's something better than the status quo. We elect, they neglect, then they have to go. Yeah. Gonna beat back the bank attack. Gonna beat, beat back that bank attack. We gonna beat back the bank attack. We gonna beat, beat back that bank attack. I said up with the people, yeah, yeah. And down with the banks, those dirty ways. I said up with the people, yeah. Hello. Um, we're an anti-capitalist organization, and that really informs all of our work. And so in developing a community land trust, we were interested in three things. One, removing homes from the dynamics of the marketplace. Uh, number two, permanent control of homes and land uh, by the community, permanent collective control. And three, we wanted to avoid interest payments to banks, which can often account for 30 or 40 percent of the cost of a, a home. We did a study of all the foreclosures that had happened in our neighborhood between 2005 and 2013. It was about 500 foreclosures. Um, and we found, based on, on a calculation method that was developed by the Federal Reserve Bank in Philadelphia, we found that about a third of, in about a third of these cases, the financial institutions would have been better off donating the home to us rather than going through the, the uh, judicial foreclosure proceeding the marketing of the home, uh, the closure, et cetera, et cetera. They would have lost less money if they had donated the homes to us. So we felt like we had a pretty solid uh, theoretical foundation to build our, our uh, community land trust that would be both in the interests of the community and in the interests of the of financial institutions. <clears throat> yeah, so moving forward, um... Just to give everybody a little bit of context about Albany Park, we're located on the northwest side of the city of Chicago, um, and we are a renter-occupied neighborhood. About 62% of our residents are renters, uh, compared to 37% uh, being owners. And a lot of our uh, constituents are Latinx immigrants, uh, mostly undocumented uh, from Central America, but there's also residents from very diverse background from all around the world, uh, from refugees from Africa and Asia. Um, so making us one of the most diverse, so one of the, one of the most diverse uh, neighborhoods in the United States. Um, so we wanna talk about this uh, gentrification and the displacement that is happening in Albany Park. So we are very much looking at a microscopic level context uh, about documenting the displacement that is happening in our community. Uh, and we're doing this through a report that we just are launching today into the public, the displacement in Albany Park, housing park, the loan from tenants that will be available for all of you to download out of our folder uh, from Centro Autonomo. Um, and in it, you will find that um, multiple corporations are coming into Albany Park and displacing hundreds if not thousands of families from our neighborhood, uh, pressing them out, um, giving them 30 days notice as many of the times when uh, they have lived there for 25, 10 years at a time. Uh, and this is what we're dealing with. This is the, this is the struggle that our residents are facing. Um, so one of the ways that we see the community mantras being used is as a tool, uh, as an anti-capitalist tool to create housing uh, that is community control that creates real affordable housing. Uh, and we do this through very different methods from one to one, doing popular education, uh, high school, a program that we have uh, from uh, work, community workshops, community meetings. Uh, we do tenants unions, tenants rights education. We're organizing our community and making connections between homeowners, tenants, uh, other community-based groups in order to really create uh, something that goes beyond our microscopic scale 
of Albany Park into creating real partnerships of a citywide coalition that would eventually, we would like to see CLTs all around, not just in Chicago, but in the nation to make sure that we stabilize our affordable housing stock in our own local context uh, and making sure that we are really creating development without displacement. Um, in Casas del Pueblo, we have had a victory where we were able to pressure Fannie Mae into uh, donating, not donating, uh, but selling a home, a property of our former uh, homeowner uh, into putting it into Casas del Pueblo Community Land Trust and making it one of the, making two affordable units uh, where now the former homeowner is able to keep the residents, be able to live in one of the units, and we were able to create another affordable unit uh, for low-income people. Um, and so this is kind of the first home that we have, and we hope that in the beginning, in the next couple months, uh, we'll be creating a campaign to create, uh, to be asking, requesting financial institutions for the donations of multiple properties that are in foreclosure, that are vacant in our neighborhood uh, and making sure that they are given to the community land trust in order for us to be able to have control of our affordable housing stock. Uh, so in conclusion, we really are all about making the connections between tenants, homeowners, and other community-based groups and using the community land trust tool as a tool that can really create autofixion or self-determined social housing uh, that anybody can be using uh, in their own context, in their own local um, neighborhoods and communities. Malcolm, we can't hear you. Sorry about that, folks. Thank you again, Antonio and Tom from Casa del Pueblo Community Land Trust and Centro Autonomo in Chicago, Illinois. We're going to be moving to our next specifically for their presentation. Please feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll lift it up at the end of the call. So next up, we have from the Women's Community Revitalization Project in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Nora Liktash. So go ahead and take it away, Nora. Oops. I want to go back for perfect. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nora, and I work with the Women's Community Revitalization Project, also known as WCRP. And I want to talk about how uh -oh. it's she's Nora, we're getting, we're getting background. I know. What do I do about that? Do you have, is your, you just want to have your computer or your phone on? You don't want, you want to mute one of them. Okay. Is this better? Mute your computer. Yes. I don't know how to mute the computer. Do you? No, it's good now. You can talk. It's, you're perfectly clear. Okay, great. Sorry. So I'm going to talk about why groups in our neighborhood created a community land trust and also how starting the land trust led to citywide campaigns for community control of land and for dollars to develop that land. Um, all this work was done in coalition and all of us joined the coalitions. All of us joined the coalition because our members can't afford their housing costs if they can find housing at all, and because so many of us are getting pushed out of the communities that we call home. Um, WCRP is a women-led community development corporation, corporation. with a two-part mission. Nora, we're getting the echo again. Yeah, and I'm so sorry, I have no idea why. Is the uh, are you calling in by phone? I am calling in by phone, and I don't know how to turn off the um your computer. Uh huh. I'll try. Okay, that that sounds good now. Okay, great. I think that's better. In any event, we started the CLT because um 
Well, I'll just take a step back. The organization has a two-part mission. We build houses, and we've built 250 of them, affordable rentals, and we build and support leadership of all of us who are part of this work. Okay, that is not my dog. I just want to say that. Um, and we know that the de leadership development grows out of our organizing. I just need to show you a little bit about our neighborhood in order to understand why we created a CLT. These are the boundaries of our neighborhood, and you see on the right a map of Philly, and that orange box is our neighborhood. And what we discovered as we started to map the vacant land in our neighborhood, factories were leaving, jobs were leaving, people were leaving, and there were more and more vacant buildings. So we started to map the neighborhood. And here you see the neighborhood again, and everything that's in gray is a vacant lot, and everything that's black is a vacant building. So what we all knew from being in our communities was that there was too much vacant land. At the same time as we were mapping the land, we also realized there were more and more for sale signs on those vacant pieces of property, whether it was a factory or land. And these are just some slides for what our late neighborhood looks like over time. The one on the left top was a vacant site in 2006, and today it's a small market rate, commercial and residential. Um, the community coalition in our neighborhood started doing a listening project talking about what's happening with the vacancy, what's happening in the neighborhood as a whole with all the changes, but we also discovered the tool of community land trust, and we asked folks if they were interested in learning more about a land trust. We reported back to the 300 folks plus folks we talked to through the listening project, and folks were really interested in the data, especially about changes in demographics and prices in the neighborhood, and they asked for a second meeting. And the slide on the bottom is the second meeting where we really talked through what are the pros and cons of a community land trust. And at the end of the meeting, everyone was invited to put their name tag on a continuum. This is a great idea or this is a terrible idea. And it was at this meeting, you can see where people's name tags are, we created the Community Justice Land Trust. So now we have a land trust, but there was a real question about how to get land into our land trust, because just because you have a trust doesn't mean you can afford expensive land. And we came to understand that the problems of vacancy, blight, and in some cases market pressure were in a lot of other neighborhoods. So we brought together groups from around the city to form a coalition known as Take Back Vacant Land. And the point of this coalition is we wanted to push the city to create a land bank. But a land bank that just got land out for market rate development wasn't a land bank that we could trust. So we wanted real protections for affordability, including permanent affordability. The coalition came together to, with three values. And I know this slide is pretty dense, but our three values were fairness, accountability, and transparency. And I'm going to come back to the slide in a minute. But we did what everyone does when you want to try to build pressure to get legislation passed. We met with our electeds. We called them into the neighborhood. We had community meetings where we talked, did a lot of community education. Every weekend, we went out and did cleanup of lots, lots of times a few cleanups. And this was like a three-year process, but I'm speeding up because I only have four minutes here. And towards the end of the um, campaign, we, we um, posted vacant land in council districts where we wanted to pressure the council people to vote on the legislation. So the good news is we won, and we actually won language in our land bank legislation for each of our goals. So now that we've won land, or a good mechanism to get land, the next step was to try to fight for resources for development on that land, especially in neighborhoods like ours that are gentrifying. So the campaign is known as Development Without Displacement, and we're working to pass laws that will require developers to pay, pay their fair share to help create affordable housing. The end. Sorry for the reverberation. Thank you so much, Nora, for that great presentation and for sharing the incredibly inspiring victories and, and organizing in Tennessee and Philadelphia. Just want to, before we move on, want to ask, there seems to be a dog in the background of somebody's mind. Um, if you are on the line and you can hear me and you have a dog in your house that's barking, you should know that your phone is not on mute. And if you can please press star six to mute your phone uh, because the dog is getting a little bit uh, distracting for folks on the call. Um, so please, please be mindful of muting your phone if you can. Next up, we have 
Yeah, what we can is, is I'm going to mute everybody and the physicians can unmute themselves just so hopefully we don't hear the dog. All attendees are muted. All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star 6. Okay, great. Thank you, Tony, for that. Okay, Next I'm up just... from Detroit. From Detroit, Hello? Michigan, we have Reverend Joan Ross and uh, from the storehouse of Hope CLT and Aaron Handelsman from Detroit People's Platform. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, and to everyone on the call, welcome to Detroit this afternoon. It is an honor to be on the call today to just uh, give you an update of some of the tremendous work on the ground here in Detroit. We are the Storehouse of Hope. Um, and just to give you a little background, the Storehouse was formed in 2008 as an emergency food pantry on the north end of Detroit. We are currently serving about 3,000 households annually as an emergency food pantry. Back in 2010, we began a conversation in Detroit around equity and how we could regain equity. And of course, we came up with six points of equity and how community could get control again using these six points. Today, we wanna to talk about the work that we've been doing with Community Land Trust. Last year in Detroit, we were the country's a history of foreclosed properties, tax foreclosed properties, with over 40,000 properties being foreclosed on uh, in the auction. We were successful as an organization with the help of a lot of friends and a couple of really strong organizations to do a GoFundMe campaign in which we raised over $108,000. In addition to some personal donations that we received of another $30,000, and what we call the Keep Our Homes Detroit campaign. We use that money to purchase 15 properties. Of the 40,000 properties in Detroit, we were informed that 8,000 of those properties still had families living in them. So our effort was to try to save those families, keep our homes and keep our uh, families in our communities. So with the $138,000, we were able to purchase 15 homes they are spread out all across the city of Detroit in the seven council districts. Detroit is divided up into council districts. So we have in some districts, one home, in some districts, two or three homes. And we'll use that as a strategy to continue to organize communities <clears throat> around issues that are affecting those homes in the council districts. So we face a lot of challenges with doing our CLT in this way. First of all, the housing stock in Detroit is pre and post World War II. They are very, very old structures. So all of the houses that we purchased are in extreme disrepair. It certainly is heart rendering to see the conditions that people are living in on a daily basis just to survive one more day in Detroit. Some of them have no heat, no water, no lights. Um, we had families that were sleeping in their cars at night because they couldn't stay in the house, it was too cold. So we've had a lot of challenges with repair problems and those things in the 15 homes. The biggest thing is putting square pegs in round holes. The 15 homes that we purchased, those families did not know what a community land trust was. So just bringing them on board and getting them acclimated to the stewardship principles and to how a community land trust operates. Many people have never heard of ground leases where they own the house and we own the land. So it's been an educational process. Some of the families that we have are unable even to pay 30% of their income in rent. Many of the homes were uh, had been willed to people. They were in generation after generation belonging to the same families. So they had never paid rent before. They had barely been able to pay their taxes. And as you can see from the foreclosure, that didn't always happen. So people aren't even able to pay 30% of income for the rent that we're charging. It's a socially, they, many of them have social challenges. They are some recovering 
um, addicts. Some have been incarcerated and have returned home to find these situations. So we deal with a lot of the social challenges. There's some that are still non-cooperative. Out of the 15 homes, we have four homes where the people have failed to cooperate or to come forward to work with us at all. The other challenge is that the homes cover the entire city. They're not isolated to one special area that we can build community base in a solid area. We are having to work across all communities in all situations. And of course, the one that challenges us all is resources are limited. And currently the, the political scene in Detroit uh, don't have a lot of support for community land trust. So, Aaron? Um, so that, um, I, I'm working with an organization called the Detroit People's Platform, and we've been running a citywide uh, coalition to kind of build the movement for community land trust and community control of land for the last three years in the city, uh, which Reverend Ross and Storehouse Pope are a member of. People's Platform, I'll just introduce you to, and then I'll get into how we've been doing work around land justice in the city over the last three years. Um, the People's Platform is an organization of organizations, not unlike Right to the City, um, except in addition to housing and land, we're also dealing with transit, um, food, and a number of other issues that you see here. Good governance, good jobs, food, poverty, inequality, and land and housing. So we organize with existing organizations, neighborhood block clubs, and those who are most directly impacted by injustice to build power and movement um, to create the alternatives that we know we need and deserve to fix those problems. Um, in Detroit right now, I can't get into all of the context, but Reverend Ross mentioned the largest tax foreclosure in US history. That happened last year, over 100,000 people facing foreclosure. And this year, it's the same situation, over 60,000 homes or parcels in foreclosure. Um, and each of those homes potentially containing multiple people. So again, we have a pretty phenomenal crisis level situation with housing. In addition to this decades long cycle of disinvestment, job loss, displacement, um, and now this narrative of opportunity in Detroit. And so People's Platform is really trying to hold the space across multiple issues, but especially land and housing to reclaim the narrative around what this opportunity means. We know that in Detroit, um, there's a long legacy known nationally for innovation um, and creativity, whether it's from the industrialization and the personal democracy, uh, Motown, or now we see Detroit as the canary in the mine for what neoliberalism looks like taken to the extreme at home. And we don't want that. So what we're saying is the opportunity really is not this status quo perpetuation that folks like Dan Gilbert and John Hans and other land grabbers and speculators are promoting that would support their private profit, profit, but instead we're faced with an opportunity to implement new solutions that really uh, remediate the, the long structural ills that have created the situation we have today to build a better future that's based on values of community control, equity, and racial justice. Um, we have a lot of obstacles, as Reverend Ross mentioned, and some of them are opportunities. So like Philly, we do have a land bank authority, except unlike Philly, it's not one that we particularly trust, uh, but they do own over 90,000 parcels of land, which is about one in every four parcels in the city. And so we've been working with them to try to force them or encourage them to adopt policies that would support permanent affordability, community control of land and donation back into uh, land trusts. I'll go over some of what we've accomplished. I mentioned the Community Land Trust Coalition. That's about 25 community organizations that have been uh, meeting over the last three years to research, do popular education and self-education <clears throat> around community land trusts and other forms of sustainable and equitable development. Um, so the Storehouse of Hope project was one of the most advanced projects of that, and we are working with several other organizations around the city who are actively seeking to build out their own community land trust based on these shared values of community control, transparency, accountability, and permanent affordability. We've also uh, created a, an authority watch group. Uh, Detroit, as I said, being the bastion of neoliberalism in the country has basically replaced a lot of the traditional governmental functions with authorities that are neither private nor public. 
So we send teams to go and watchdog those authorities, make public comment at their board meetings, um, and push them to, to do the work that's going to benefit the existing residents of Detroit. And one small victory was getting them to write um, an official document stating that they would support the donation of DLBA owned land to community land trusts as long as city council approves that, which we're hoping we can accomplish this year. We've also been working a lot on a policy level to kind of create the opportunities on a policy level that activists on the ground who we work with can then benefit from. So one of those is creating inclusionary zoning ordinance, part of which would also create um, a housing trust fund that we're trying to build specifically to fund permanently affordable housing like community land trusts. We've been involved with a number of groups through a coalition to help fight the tax foreclosures last year and this year. Um, and as Reverend Ross mentioned, led the campaign uh, to keep our homes Detroit, which was very successful and is now resulting in this work. Um, and finally, this summer, we're going to be rolling out the Homes for All campaign locally as part of the Right to the City national campaign. And you can see specifically on this slide what, uh, what we're demanding with that. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Ross and Aaron. It was great to have you share what's going on in Detroit and definitely stimulating a lot of questions and conversation in the chat box. Thank you again both for uh, sharing. Um, reminder to folks, you can keep putting your questions and comments in the chat box. Next up, we are going to hear from Picture the Homeless in New York City. And we have Lynn Lewis, Marcus Morris, and Avernetta Henry who will be joining us from PTH to share about their work. Take it away, y'all. Sorry, folks. Thank you again to Reverend Ross and Aaron for that presentation. Next up, we're going to have Picture the Homeless from New York City with Lynn Lewis, Marcus Morris, and Avernetta Henry, who are going to be sharing about their work. Take it away, y'all. Can you hear us? Loud Can you hear us now? <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, far out. Okay, so guys, w once again, my name is Marcus Moore. I'm from Pitching the Homeless. And the reason why Pitching the Homeless is so excited about the CLT model is, is because we know with this model, it's a fresh of new air here in New York City. And what we are doing, we're, we're now currently trying to um, put together a CLT where people – who are struggling and who are homeless are able to be able to afford to have a place to live, such as the CLT, because we understand with the CLT model, it's different ways that you can go about financing and, and, and helping a person these who are currently homeless. Okay, so one of the things that we're, we're looking at beyond the – CLT and own ownership of land is how are the buildings on the land actually going to make the housing affordable? And so one of the things that we've been looking at here, it's a densely populated urban area. We're in East Harlem in Manhattan. Um, we have a lot of multifamily apartment buildings. We also have uh, one of the highest numbers of vacant lots in the city. And so we're looking at bundling smaller apartment buildings together to form one large multi-building co-op. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at doing is using development, getting control of vacant lots, and then the land trust working with friendly, conscious developers to develop housing and also commercial space. And commercial space could include things like supermarkets that we need, but could also include cultural spaces. And using these multifamily co-op model to create an economy of scale, um, there are a bunch of city-owned buildings in East Harlem. We're in negotiation, um, and none of this would work without community organizing, right? So we've been organizing among homeless 
and housed folks that have an interest in preserving their homes and creating new units of housing. This is Arvonetta Henry, and um, we do have one community land trust development called Cooper Square, and they had started fighting to keep their development, keep their housing in 1959, and going up against Robert Moses with the help of um, Mayor LaGuardia, they were able to obtain and keep their housing and keep in turn, they were able to regulate and get the support from the city, work on keeping their rents down. See, the problem with um, York is our rent is so damn high now in the city that people are being gentrified out of every area of the boroughs. And Cooper Square taught us how that we can work with the city and gain community, gain materials to um, maintain and get a community land trust. At, at this point, Cooper Square it has been turned into a co-op development, but it was family orientated and able to keep the rent down affordable for everyone. So in East Harlem, 40% of residents in this community are below 30% of area median income. And the mayor's housing plan and the mandatory inclusionary housing that was passed last week by the city council uh, doesn't include housing for almost half this community and this is replicated all over our city. So the model that we're constructing here in East Harlem is something that can be replicated citywide. Um, it's only through organizing, and um, Raquel is a land trust organizer for Picture the Homeless. She's also on the call, and um, Anthony, who's a leader. It's only through organizing and popular education that we've actually been able to enter into negotiations with the city for them to gift um, land and buildings to the land trust and the um, mutual housing association that we're working on creating. Um, I think we're at time, so we're going to wrap it up. But the last slide is about gaining ground. Um, and as Arvanetta said, rents here in New York are off the chain. Yes. Um, and the shelter system here is costing the city over a billion dollars a year and costing homeless folks much more. And so our CLT approach is kind of nestled within a bigger strategy, and uh, we're happy to share any of our materials. Yes, at this point, we have created, through education, we have created a game board, and we have, we're taking this game board, and we show, taking it to different community districts and showing people how community land trusts work, how it keeps the rent down, how it's family orientated, how it helps them to be invested in their own um, unit, and how you can raise your family and stay intact as a family unit. We final word. So the final word, ladies and gentlemen, we understand that to you know we can talk about community land trusts and stuff like that, but what one of our extension, extension, I should say extension allies, we have learned how to give the regular people with our new idea of a new future. Thank you. Thank you, Picture the Homeless. Just want to make sure that my audio is working. I've been told that it's been a little off. Can somebody give me a thumbs up if I sound good? Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Picture the Homeless. Thank you, y'all, for such a lively chat box and for throwing out questions. Those questions are starting to be answered by presenters and each other, and a lot of dialogue on that chat box will also be lifting up those questions during the question and answer section. And our fifth and final but no less critical 
and, and brilliant presentation is from Cooperation Jackson and the Fannie Lou Hamer, whoops, sorry about that typo, CLT in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, with Sacagawea Saki Hall. Take it away, Saki. We can't hear you, Saki. Okay, let me try this. Can you hear me now? Yes. You guys can hear me? Okay. So yeah. at first when we tested it, my computer screen mic wasn't working and now the cell phone is acting up. So I'm going to go ahead and um, end the cell phone call and just talk to you all on the computer. Um, okay, great. So um, I want to just give an overview. I want to talk about who we are, talk about the context of um, here in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, why we're doing the CLT and why it's so critical and important to our work. Um, but before I start, I, um, we try to always acknowledge our ancestors. And so I want to acknowledge those that paved the way for um, our current work, especially here in Mississippi. Um, so Cooperation Jackson was launched in the spring of 2014, so we're approaching our second year anniversary by a group of individuals deeply moved by the Jackson Cush Plan, and we're striving to see its vision of economic democracy and social transformation realized. Um, we're a membership-based organization, and we see ourselves as an emerging vehicle for economic democracy, sustainable community development, and community ownership. Uh, community control. So our broad mission is to advance the development of economic democracy in Jackson, Mississippi, and we see ourselves doing that by building a solidarity economy, which is really anchored by a network of cooperative and other types of uh, worker-owned and democratically self-managed enterprises. Our vision is to create an alternative um, built on equity, cooperation, worker democracy, um, you know, being able to provide meaningful living wage jobs, affordable quality houses, um, and really build community well. Um, Jackson, I would talk just a little bit about uh, Jackson. So Jackson is a majority black city um, and a majority Republican state. And right now the state legislature, um, which has been wreaking havoc um, here for us, it has a super, uh, the Republicans have a super majority. Um, Cooperation Jackson, uh, because of us being so new in our capacity, we've decided to focus in on a particular area of Jackson. And so that outlined um, in front of you. The medium income for the Black community in Jackson as a whole is a little less than $30,000. And so in our uh, targeted area, um, it's the income is similar to the overall in Jackson. Um, looking across that bottom part, you see it's majority 98, 96% Black, um, and that medium income is a little bit less than $30,000. Uh, $30, um, and so with the combination of industrialization, white flight, black middle class flight, you know, the, the continuing structural racism that exists um, here in Mississippi, a declining tax base has really wrecked havoc um, on the city of Jackson. There's chronic underemployment, unemployment, uh, the housing market is deeply depressed, um, the schools are, public schools are being attacked. Um, and really even the infrastructure of the city is decaying and, and antiquated. And so as you see here in these photos, a large section of Jackson are um, blighted and vacant and actually 41% of the parcels in our area are unused. Um, so the reality for us though is both an opportunity and a challenge. And um, as you see the struggle in Jackson is really a struggle for black self-determination versus all these different plans of urban renewal and gentrification. Um, and so there are four primary development plans um, that I wanted you to at least know about, and I'll show you visually what that means for the area that Cooperation Jackson is, is working in. Um, and just in this legislative session, the Capital Corridor uh, bill was passed, and that basically gives state control over large parts of 
um, the city of Jackson. Um, and so looking at this map, you see the area that was in yellow that I showed where we are, and that's where our base is, that's where the Lumumba Center is. And all of these different shades and colors, you might, you know, it might not be that clear for you to see up close, but that is the encroachment of all these different development plans. So we're getting hit um, and gentrification and, and development from the medical corridor is all towards that top in orange, and that overlaps this green uh, capital corridor. Uh, Jackson State is going to be having an entertainment and the football stadium moved, and so that's going to wipe out a whole community that's right south of us. Um, and so, you know, it's 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 critical right now. Although housing and land is affordable in Jackson. Like so many of you know, in the different cities that you're in, these development plans and the legislation and the bills coming out of uh, local city councils really um, is gonna push the working class black community with the majority of Jackson out um, of their neighborhoods. Um, and I, I do wanna take a second to say that during the brief eight month period that Shokwe Lumumba um, was in office, the administration was really able to stall and halt a lot of this development work and really change the context in which they were situated. And so although these plans have been around for a while, they're um, now, unfortunately, back in full swing. Um, uh, just near where we are, there are over 50 housing developments, um, two-story houses, multifamily houses that have been um, created. So we're seeing that uh, closer and closer into our neighborhoods. Um, and so we, I'm skipping through a couple of these slides, but we really are talking about having a holding strategy, and that's where the community land trust comes in, um, and being able to put ourselves in a position where we're uh, really proactively creating these alternatives, um, and in order to address the challenges that we see facing, like decommodifying a significant portion of the land in West Jackson by purchasing it and holding it into a CLT. Um, and so... Uh, the Sustainable Communities Initiative uh, diagram is a little <laughs> uh, messed up, but I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit anyway. Um, in my version, it looks a lot clearer. Um, but the Sustainable Communities Initiative is one of the few bottom-up uh, development processes initiatives taking place in Jackson. Um, and so our goal is to create an uh, echo village. And you see at the bottom, the community land trust um, is really the anchor to this echo village, but the echo village will provide permanent affordable housing, facilitate uh, the creation of quality living wage jobs through developing cooperative enterprises, um, the production of uh, sustainable energy, and the production and distribution of access to high uh, affordable quality foods. And so we have kind of like this link that you're not able to see, even though you see those blue arrows, connecting the cooperatives like the um, Urban Farming um, Freedom Farms Cooperative and connecting um, that to the housing cooperatives and how we see all of those interlinked, um, intertwined and really um, supporting a, a, a whole community. Um, let me see if I can skip through. So we've named the Community Land Trust Fannie Lou Hamer, and the mission of the Fannie Lou Hamer Community Land Trust is to build a sustainable community in West Jackson, preserve the community assets for future generations by really removing the land. And I'm glad that um, folks in Chicago started off by mentioning being anti-capitalist because we're really clear that the just transition that we're talking about making is moving away from that extraction moving away from that exploitation and be able, being able to create, um, you know, economic democracy, new models for how we cooperate with each other. Um, and so the speculative market here in Jackson is increasing um, and being able to create the community land trust, uh, which would remove that land from the market and hold it in the trust forever is really, really important um, to us being able to preserve, um, that's not my side, being able to preserve um, the residents of Jackson who've been here for generations being able to stay. Um, so I'm not sure. I think there are a couple of slides missing. I had some photos wanting to show everybody the Lumumba Center and the kind of progress that we've made 
in the short term in the short time that we've been around in the last two years we were able to purchase by now we have about 15 um, parcels we have the Shokwe Lumumba Center for Economic uh, Democracy and Development we have two homes um, that already have residents that are beginning to build the housing um, cooperatives we have the urban farm and I'm, I wish I could show you these pictures because um, it's really exciting to see the back of the Luma Center go from a childcare playground and all of the work that went into creating what it is now, which is a full um, producing um, garden farm. And we've all been eating and buying the greens and the collards and um, uh, and the produce that's happening back there. And we're definitely expanding those things. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. I know that we have lots of time to talk more and I'm really looking forward to the conversation and the dialogue and the questions. Great, thank you so much, Saki. And I apologize for the photos. We'll see if we can get those photos up before the end of the call so folks can see those. Can folks hear me? Cool. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Tony Romano who's gonna talk a little bit about the toolkit that we we're releasing and share with you that information. Great. Thanks, Malcolm. I'll be very brief so we can get to all your beautiful questions and comments. But a lot of people have already been asking, you know, can we have a CLT 101? Can we learn more? So the CLT working group in Homes for All has spent some time creating this planning guide um, to help folks learn where existing resources are. So we get a lot of them from our guidance and mentors. Uh, National CLT Network has been amazing. They, they are called Grounded Solutions now. They merged. We get a lot of support from them. And then our two other mentors, which are really key, are Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative and Burlington Associates out of Burlington, Vermont. And those are two of the most powerful, great models of CLTs in the country that we're learning from. So we have this guide, and it really does two things. It connects folks to existing resources, and it seeks to create new resources in three areas, which is our particular focus with CLTs. So one, building CLTs in communities of color, which are the hardest hit communities in this country. That's our focus, one. Two, we're focusing building CLTs not predominantly around home ownership but predominantly around rentership and with lower income families who can't afford in, in the market to buy uh, a home. So people of color, renters, and then finally, our model is that CLTs must be built in connection with building a broader housing justice movement, a building power. So none of our folks are building them in isolation and CLTs are one of multiple strategies and someone asked about the small scale, you know, our folks will be building a CLT and they'll be fighting for rent control um, across the city, um, for example. So we must use multiple strategies simultaneously. So this toolkit and all the links will be shared with folks. Um, and then second, we will let you all know when upcoming trainings will be offered around this, whether it's by Homes for All or by one of our mentors and guides, uh, Grounded Solutions, Dudley Street or Burlington. Um, we'll be letting y'all know, everyone who registered, we have your email. If there's uh, contact information we don't have, please put it in the um, chat box and we'll get it to you. And I would like to say that uh, Tony Pickett mentioned an amazing movie that's coming out, Arts of Justice. A lot of people don't know, but the first community land trust in this country goes back around the late 60s, the 70s, and it was created in Albany, Georgia, by black working class residents. And it is an amazing story, and they started this tradition, and we're trying to continue it. So when that movie comes out this year, make sure you see it. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Tony. And we're going to go ahead and put those links in the chat box as well so folks can access those directly. We're going to now open up to some of the questions that folks have been throwing out. Lots of great questions. If during the chat there are folks who are on the call who would like to chime in, you can either do that through the chat or you can press star six to unmute yourself um, and, and share. We know there's other community land trusts and folks that are experimenting with alternative housing models. 
that are on the call, and we'd love to hear from you. So the first question we're going to lift up is specifically for Saki, but other for others where it's relevant, how do you stay accountable to an anti-capitalist value while actively purchasing lands? Saki, we can't hear you. And I'll go ahead and open it up to the whole panel. I think Saki might have gotten disconnected, so we'll bring bring that back to her when she gets off. Well, one of the things that um, that we, we do at Picture the Homeless is we're looking at who's going to benefit from ownership of the land because the goal is not just to own land and acquire. It's to preserve housing for the lowest-income residents and, and create opportunities so there can be housing created for homeless folks and the lowest-income members of the community that aren't homeless yet. And so that is an anti-capitalist strategy because we're not owning land in order to profit off of it. We're owning land so that community members are not displaced and that people that have already been displaced have a, have a home. Thanks, Lynn. Does anybody else want to chime in on that question? Um, so, I totally agree with uh, Lynn's, Lynn's point on that. And also just a thought experiment. It's not practical, but if we're talking about decommodifying land, there is a contradiction, right, around the idea of constraining an individual's ability to get wealth, especially if they're already lower income and have experienced disinvestment and loss of housing-based wealth. But in, in Detroit, I thought, you know, what if what if all the people who are moving into the city, right, the sort of wealthier, whiter, professional class, what if they were required to have their homes in a CLT so that they could invest in Detroit but not flip the homes and profit from the disinvestment that they or their parents are directly benefiting from? And I don't think that's practical, but I think it's just an it's an interesting idea to contemplate as, as the rights of private home ownership continue to be pretty unrestrained. That cycle of plunder and profit continues. So at some point there's got to be a way to interrupt it. But absent that, I think Lynn's point, you know, we get the land to try to benefit the people who have been dispossessed the most. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Saki. Yeah. I'm having all kinds of technical problems. Let me put the headphones on so that you guys don't have the feedback. I I thought it was, and you know, maybe it's been answered already. I think I heard some people responding to it, and from what I heard, it's been answered. <laughs> um, okay. I mean, you know, we. I'm not. You know, how do you take? When when the you know groups and the developers I hear her. Looks like we lost Saki, you. I think we've lost you again. Um I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our next question and we can come back to you, Saki, if you jump back on. Um, this question is specifically for Philadelphia. Does the land bank legislation have specific language that prioritizes disposition to community land trusts? Is the land from the land bank going to community land trusts? I'm sorry, say the question one more time about the um, sure. land bank. Yes, yeah, so the question is, does the land bank legislation that y'all passed have specific language that prioritizes disposition to community land trusts? So is and is the land from that land bank going to CLTs? Mm -hmm. So the first parcel that was um, transferred is going to our CLT, and we're just getting up and running as a land bank. When we initially started drafting, helping to draft the legislation, we wanted to put specific requirements for sustained affordability, but really had to back off of that because in Philadelphia, too many folks do not know what a CLT is. Um, 
can you hear me better now? Sorry. And so we have general yeah, language in the so land package. About sustained affordability and how important it is. We also we also have um, a, we have right now a seat on the land bank board, and it's because of our organizing, and that's really about um, sustained affordability is being pushed in all of the strategic planning efforts and all of the progress reports. Great, thank you, Nora. Does anybody else have any? I know in Detroit you'll have a land bank. Is there specific legislation that parts prioritizes this position to CLTs? Uh, no, there is not. Um, that's actually one of the main things that we're working on right now. The land bank basically doesn't have, well, there are few policies that we're aware of that exist um, that guide the land bank's disposition. So. We did create a set of policy recommendations that would have if adopted created that result, but they did not adopt those recommendations. And so that's why we're trying to go back to the ground to build up the base so that when we make a demand, they feel a lot more pressure to, to implement it. Um, but right now we're just trying to get them to get more policies on the books. And that's especially different because the city doesn't have a master plan right now and is in the process of building that out. So it seems like Nobody's really taking full responsibility for making decisions. And as a result, if you're a political player or a big money developer, you can find the inside track and residents in the neighborhoods are kind of left out and told they're going to need to wait. Thanks, Aaron. So we're going to go to the next question, which is from Paul from the Strand Collective in Oakland, California. And Paul is in the process of purchasing their home through a CLT in Oakland and trying to develop a political project out of that collective. They don't qualify for mortgage assistance in the city, and they're trying to think through how to use CLTs as a model for working class people, people and people of color to buy homes collectively and remove properties from the speculative market. And one of the things they're running into is that the down payment and independent wealth that you need in, in their experience to purchase a home in the land trust keeps the land trust mainly in white and upper middle class communities. So are there any recommendations or similar struggles that folks are facing around these issues as you're implementing CLTs? Does anyone want to take that question? Is there anyone on the line that has thoughts or similar struggles or recommendations that would want to offer thoughts? Yes, Lynn, I can restate the question. So uh, to summarize it, uh, running into the issue that you need a down payment and independent wealth often to be able to purchase either collectively or um, or individually a home on a land trust. And that, that often keeps land trusts held in mainly white and upper middle class communities. And they're trying in Oakland to think about how do we make sure that working class communities and communities of color can access homes on these land trusts if they don't have money for a down payment. Mm. What, we're, what we've been doing in New York is owning, organizing, that is, organizing to move the city to give us city-owned property so that the, there's, you know, the, 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 the issue with rehabbing buildings or new construction is then you have a debt, right? So we're in the process of negotiating with the city to not only get buildings, but to get uh, a, a significant amount of the rehab costs covered. Um, we have been looking to models like sweat equity that used to exist in New York and many other places that are just public policies 
for political purposes that were discontinued. Um, so putting folks to work and learning skills in, in the rehab of these buildings. So the, our focus has been organizing so that we don't have to borrow money, and that way really, really low-income folks who are being displaced can afford to stay and move back. Your so, so what we've done in Detroit, of course, is the, is the GoFundMe campaign. And we can see that as a real problem coming up for us as, as many of our homeowners or our renters at this point aren't able to qualify for mortgages. Last year in Detroit, there were only 400 mortgages issued in the whole city. So there will be a problem uh, when we get to the point of trying to qualify them for mortgages. In the right now, we're using GoFundMe campaigns to raise the first money and we've got a list of some private donors who are very interested in the CLT that we are back in conversation with about extending their generosity to us to continue the work of rehabbing those houses. But um, like they said, we don't wanna go in debt to try to rehab the houses either. So we're gonna have to use and rely on the public support that we get and the encouragement of community to support community. I know in the past in New York City with the sweat equity program, people would go in and help renovate the, the vacant apartments and so forth. This way it cut down on the rent and as well as cut down on the maintenance and it was they would have that opportunity to move into that apartment that they helped rebuild. And it didn't cost the city much of anything because they put the time in to build that apartment. And so if we can reduce sweat equity, in turn, the client or the tenant would have that opportunity to own that apartment. You know, I'd just like and to talk about it And they're presently doing it in San Francisco. I'm sorry. So in Philly, our current project is 36 rental townhomes that over a compliance period, which is roughly 15 years, the tenants who are very, very low income, they don't get turned away because their income is too low, um, um, can build their ability to become homeowners at the end of the compliance period. So we have a fund that we capitalize so people will have a down payment and we work with folks so that they would become eligible for a small mortgage over roughly starting in year eight. So by year 15, they can own the house and the community land trust owns the land. So this is um, Saki, can you guys hear me? Yeah. I wanted to I wanted to jump in because I think that um so two things come to mind. One, um I think we're 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 also talking and hoping that we can talk more and more about um being able to challenge oh gosh, I don't think you guys my computer froze. Can you still hear me even though I can't see? Yeah, yeah. So it's loading. Okay, yeah. okay, cool. Okay. Um like really being able to, so it's one thing to purchase um, the homes and say that they're being in, in a put in a community land trust so that they're out of the market and, that, and therefore, you know, can move away from, we can move away from this capitalist model and logic of ownership, right? Um, but I think part of that, honestly, has to be addressed also with the idea of um, people uh, wanting to still be the owner of the home, even though they agree to the home being on, a, you know, the shared community governed land trust. Um, and so, you know, one of the reasons why outside of our larger, you know, aim of developing cooperatives um, and, you know, within the solidarity economy, moving towards economic democracy, um, looking at housing cooperatives is because, and, and for two things, one, um, it can alleviate and, and help support uh, the people, you know, those in the community that really aren't in a position to get a mortgage and may never ever be in a position to get a mortgage by being able to collectively pool resources um, and have shared equity. Um, for us, we're looking at being able to have the ground lease to the housing co-op itself and provide um, and, be, and be the ones who um, 
and be the ones who provide the loan with a zero percent with a zero percent interest. And so we're not we're we, we're not having to in this model, and you know we may have to in, include a more traditional model as well. But in this model, we're not having to get people ready to be um, you know more like bank loan ready, um, mortgage loan ready. And in a way, I think that's an opportunity to also talk about um, to also talk about and challenge this idea of um, individual uh, individual home ownership and the idea that somehow that really helps um, build wealth in a way that um, is equitable and spreads across like the, the number of people in our community that really, really need it. Like, um, and so, so I, I wanted to throw that, that out there um, because it sounds like uh, a couple of people and people on the call who have presented um, we're really, we really are trying to think of how to do this um, in an anti-capitalist framework, but then also how to transition <laughs> away from capitalism, right? And so I think we even have to think about um, how we get creative with this traditional community land trust model. Um, and we also are looking at, um, although it still is in the framework of ownership, we're looking at being able to have people who um, can rent to own. Um. And I, I had a question, Malcolm, I kind of wanted to put the question out to everybody. Um, we know that these five cities aren't the only cities that have incredible work going on around community land trust and other land and housing work. Um, I wanted to give a quick example in Atlanta and then to ask other people on the phone to share some of your experience and wisdom in terms of the CLT work y'all are doing. Um, I think in Atlanta, we really understood that CLT work cannot be isolated from other work, and we must always look for ways to connect the two. So here in Atlanta, we're in the midst of one of the biggest developments in the history of Atlanta, in the 80 acres in the heart of downtown, is being redeveloped and is threatening uh, to displace most of the historic black uh, residents in the surrounding communities. So we're using this um, development without displacement fight against the city, the county, and the developers to say, one of our demands is a community land trust, right? And we want land, we wanna use this leverage because everyone is looking at it, to get land from the city county, to get land from the banks, and to get the developer to commit to a permanent stream of money from the revenue every year that goes into the CLT and affordable housing. And we've actually won that from the Olympic Stadium before. So I think we need to always look creatively at how we can create the strongest community control out of any situation. I think the other thing we're looking at is if there's any policy that relates to affordable housing, where are we fighting to make sure that we define affordable housing, the priority to be community controlled affordable housing and get it on CLTs. If not, it'll automatically be defined as private ownership, 80% AMI and above, and to be flipped in 10 years. Um, so I just wanna encourage that. I wanna hear from other cities what's going on, especially if there's examples of how your CLT work is linking with other housing work. You want to talk about that? Um, let me think about it. Okay. Hello? And people can feel free to, yes, go ahead. So, um, in, you know, in New York, there's uh, neighborhoods that are undergoing rezoning. And so uh, one of them is East Harlem, where we currently work. Um, and so we were very involved with the uh, rezoning efforts. Um, and managed to get uh, disposition of, uh, of city-owned land as a recommendation um, that is go to a CLT. We've got uh, land bank legislation that we worked on in the past that got dropped. We're going to revive it um, so that CLTs is one disposition for land banks. There's a myriad of programs in New York, affordable housing programs, that are kind of dying on the vine because the previous administrations didn't fund them or neglected them. So our, we're kind of popping up in terms of citywide housing policy 
um, introducing land trust to a lot of people that, frankly, just have never heard of it, um, aren't sure how it's going to work, have questions about whether banks will like it or not. Um, we're part of a citywide coalition called the um, New York City Community Land Initiative that has been linking with uh, tenant groups and neighborhoods with home foreclosed homes. Um, and then we have, as I mentioned earlier, of course, in New York, there's you know tens of thousands. Last year, over 100,000 people went through the shelter system. Yes. And so that's a billion dollars a year New York is spending on shelters. So we've linked up, you know, the issue of shelters and housing policy. Um, and so in that, in that, along those lines, we work with groups that work on rent stabilization and rent control. I feel like we've really moved the question of community control of land and, you know, alternative models into the larger housing policy conversation in New York. So in addition to the work on the community land trust for the past three years, we've been working in Detroit to pass a community benefit agreement ordinance. It would be the first time in the country that there's an actual ordinance on a book that says development must include community and bring community benefits with it. And one of the parts of the community benefit agreement ordinance uh, talks to uh, housing and displacement and how that fits into benefiting the community. And that would be one of our strategies to bring this into a larger arena and continue to find resources that could come into community around housing, housing displacement pieces. In, in Philadelphia, can you hear me? Yes. So in Miami, to piggyback on what um, the lady just spoke about, we're also in the process of doing a community, um, a CBA with our mayors and in it, we're implementing around housing, making sure that the under the 30% AMI, those people can afford the housing that they're building and also um, making sure community is involved in those decision making. So we're, we right now have the mayor looking at that and changing the community uh, benefit agreement right now here in Miami, Florida. Hi, so this is Sharice. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you go. Oh, okay. I was just uh, wanted to say in Atlanta, we are working on a CBA as well around the Turner Field uh, Stadium uh, to get a CBA implemented around affordable housing too. And uh, land, you know, land, housing, land trust, and all of these things. So we're trying to make sure that it gets into the CBA. And I was just listening because I'm noting some of your strategies and answers. In Philly, we're looking at, we created a community land trust, a coalition a while back, and we're trying to double that land trust. And we're looking at two ideas right now. One is an anti-speculation tax. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, a housing trust fund. I'm getting mixed up with my language here. Housing trust fund to double the housing trust fund. So an anti-speculation tax. So if anyone sells a house twice within 24 months, there would be another point and a half of realty transfer tax, which would in fact double our housing trust fund. And now we're looking at something that are called impact fees for a, do a certain amount per square foot on any new construction of residential. And that would also really help add to our housing trust fund. So we're trying to create legislation with some champions in city council and get it passed. Great. Thank you, everyone. So we're going to lift up one last question. I know there's been a couple of questions that we're not going to get to, but people have been getting a lot of responses in the chat box. And so the last question is just to ask for our panelists to offer 30-second uh, final thoughts before we close off the call that you would like to leave folks with. I know 30 seconds is really tight, but I want to give you all that opportunity. And let's, let's go ahead and – oh, go ahead. Whoever's going to go, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll, go ahead. We want – Permitted housing, no more shelters. 
in New mm-hmm. York. All housing should be affordable and it's a human right. That's right. Amen. New York City. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go over to Reverend Ross in Detroit. Well, Detroit is continuing to lift up the CBA and the work that goes on here is only just the beginning. We've got a whole lot of a long way to go and a lot of things we want to cover. And thanks, Saki, for being on the call. <laughs> Thank you. But well, since you shouted Saki out, let's go over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try to be 30 seconds because I, I really um, feel like I would have liked more time to talk about kind of like this holistic approach that I think the CLT fits into. But um, and I, I think that that answers um, one of the other questions I think I saw was like, can we develop more positive, I guess, more for reaching visionary language than saying anti-capitalist. And so um, you re- uh, feel free to reach out to me and, um, and we can do that. So my 30 second comment though is scale. And so we're always talking about scale. We're always hearing about scale. And for me um, and my experience through this, I think we need to be talking about scale as growing this movement. And so if everyone on the call started CLTs and started the the amazing work that even just the presenters are talking about and really collecting in the multi-prong ways of preserving housing and making it affordable, then we that would be scale. And it's the pockets of it connected together that I think achieves scale. Thanks, Saki. Let's go over to Aaron in Detroit. Um, yeah, we're going to continue to fight to reclaim the narrative of what real development looks like and argue that development is that which increases quality of life for all people and re- basically uh, pushes against some of the, the generations of disinvestment and racial injustice that continue to prevent equitable development from happening in Detroit. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing what comes next as we roll out the Homes for All campaign in the summer. Thanks, Aaron. Can we hear from Nora in Philadelphia? Sure. It feels really good to be on this webinar, even in spite of all my technical difficulties, because sometimes it can feel like even though there's 50 of us in our coalition fighting for sustained affordability and more resources for that, it can feel lonely and it feels really good to be plugged in with other folks. So thank you. Thanks, Nora. And last but not least, let's hear from Antonio and Tom in Chicago. Yeah, I think overall, um, I really enjoy the conversation, especially from all the presenters and all the amazing questions. And I think if we can keep moving forward with thinking about how housing is a human right and how we can make that happen and use different tools, such as the community land trust from tenants, rights, tenants organizing, homeowners, um, and making sure that we are thriving together in order to create development without displacement. Thanks, Antonio. So thank you to all of our presenters. And you'll see up on the screen now, um, Saki has been flipping through the five photos uh, that you didn't get to see earlier in the presentation. But I think they're really telling for us leaving this call, which is that CLTs and, and critical experimentation around alternative housing models that remove land from the speculative market and prioritize our community's needs, whether from affordable housing to food access, to moving to an economy that ensures that our people and our planet are protected for generations. We, we see these as critical tools that we need to deepen our experimentation in and deepen the way that we talk about in our communities and with our comrades in our, in, in our neighborhoods. And we have opportunities now to be totally um, transforming the way we think about the future of development, but also the future of our neighborhoods and the way we relate to each other in our communities. So Saki, thank you for sharing those photos. Um, We're going to close off our call here today, and we want to thank everybody again for being on this third installment. This training series is going to be going on all year, um, and there was a few comments about the platform we're using, and we want to definitely thank folks for being patient with this new technology, you know, as we move these 
transformative movements into the 21st century, deeper into the 21st century. We're constantly adapting to new technology, and we appreciate Yale's patience in working through that. It's the way that we're able to keep building relationships. It's the way that we're able to keep giving feedback to each other and to finding ways to connect one of the ways of finding ways to connect across the country. Um, and we hope that folks are going to be able to keep following up with each other post this call. We won't be having a uh, training in April, but our next call, our next training, is going to be May 18th. That will be the fourth episode. And we're going to be joined by um, an, uh, an author, Matthew Desmond, who recently published a book called Evicted um, on the national eviction <laughs> epidemic and did a lot of research and interviews with many Homes for All organizations. And we're also going to be joined by residents from Homes for All organizations ac across the country who will give firsthand testimony of the eviction epidemic and our responses to the eviction epidemic. One part of getting on this call is that if you're interested in the book, the publisher has offered us a discount for all participants. So go ahead and get in and register. Um, that link is going to be live uh, following this call. So give it, a, give it a moment, and it will be getting on there. Last but not least, if you're coming off this call and you're fired up about Homes for All, you're fired up about building a new, a new economy and a new world, about moving towards a just transition, you want to be able to build with these folks, these beautiful, wonderful folks that are on the call, we want you to join Homes for All. So you can go to homesforall.org and take the pledge. You can take the pledge as an individual. You can take the pledge as an organization. We will reach out to organizations who want to become partners. And if you take the pledge as an individual, we can be able to start communicating with you about the different ways that Homes for All is moving our vision forward. So thank you again to the, I think it was about 160 people. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, Reverend Ross. Awesome. There's also, again, the folder um, with all of the toolkits and fact sheets and reports that people have released. So go ahead and get in there, get into those resources, get into the decision-making guide. Let us know if you're going to be launching a CLT or uh, a process in your community to gain control of housing or land to, to transform your community. We want to be able to support you, and we want to be able to uh, build with you as well. So thank you again, everybody. It was beautiful having you all on, and we look forward to being able to communicate in the future. Peace. Happy back. Okay, I'm going to go because my grandson is having a <laughs> wrestling match. <laughs> I want to come uh, back. Yeah, Where is it? <laughs> Good call, y'all. You killed it. Great job, and we'll schedule a debrief um, to discuss it. Good facilitation, Malcolm. Thanks, yeah, Trini. Malcolm. Thanks for chiming in. Thank you so much. I just got out of the hospital. I couldn't miss it for nothing. Oh, oh my so God. much blessings to you, Trinice. <laughs> we love you, Trinice. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Great work. Bye. Wait, are we having the debrief?